Good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. Of course, it's been time for responsible change for a long time now. So we might have to have three little dots after that name while we're waiting, but we're very patient. And we have the great privilege of having with us today a retired judge, author, Sandra Sims, probably working on your next book, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Look forward to that. I am. I am. I'm, I really am. <laughs> and while your last book was autobiographical, right? Tales from the Bench. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So will this be another fiction book? <laughs> another fiction? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it'll be it'll be uh, a collection of more perspectives, and uh, you know I'm kind of looking at talking with uh, people who have used the law, people with you know legal backgrounds, and some uh, other ways in which to address issues of justice. So I've run across some very interesting people. I'll probably be talking to you guys too, but. Uh, some very, very interesting people in our community who've done some very different things with their um, law degrees to make change. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we know, Sandra, that you choose your words carefully. So when you say use the law, you're using that in a constructive, positive sense mm -hmm. as contrasted to abuse, which- Absolutely. We <laughs> Absolutely. see a lot Because I think, you know what, one of the things that, um, um, so you, you got to introduce everybody else, but we'll get you know, one, one of the things that, you know, I've always said about the obtaining a law degree and the practice of law is that it sort of really actually prepares you to do so many other things. Um, and that's the thing, whether it's at the actual practice of law or something else, you have a skill set that takes you into a wide variety of venues in which to um, you know, address issues and, you know, and you've got a measure of, how can I say, a measure of credibility that comes with, uh, you know, having a, uh, a law degree and that kind of experience that is still of value in, in our society. Things are certainly changing rapidly on that, but there is still value in that. We'll see. Hey, and Louise, you've been doing law for quite a number of years, several decades. Fortunately, you started when you were 12, so mm -hmm. still young. Is that your sense also that the variations of paths that law degrees can open into continues to expand? Yeah, I've always, um, I agree with Sandra. I think that um, there are many ways you can use a law degree and it trains you to um, uh, for co communication and dealing with disputes and um, adversarial situations that can, you know, keep calm in the middle of the storm that can help you in other situations. We were just talking about food before this all started. So maybe the only thing it can't help you with is, is in the food business or well, cooking. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I think that you know, look at all the uh, lawyers who have gone into other roles in corporations as leaders, as CEOs, lawmakers, of course. Um, but it does prepare us by giving us a way of thinking and, I guess, dissecting and communicating, problem solving, too. Yeah. And interesting you mentioned that because you see a lot of people with multiple degrees, JD, MDs, JD, MBAs, things like that. Uh, Rebecca, you've resisted the temptation uh, for all these years. Uh, That's right. um, what's behind that perspective? Well, um, I'm a career commercial complex insurance claims professional. And so um, I learned subject matter expertise, negotiation and dispute resolution from that angle. Um, and obviously insurance is contract, you know, contract law. So I don't have a law degree, but I, I've learned a lot about um, mm -hmm. the law in that area uh, without formal legal training. 
and across the United States, almost all 50 states and internationally. So um, totally different track, um, very valuable experience, applicable across subject matters and across mm -hmm. industries because insurance touches everything. Well, yes, yes. And it's yeah. really kind of at the heart of much of what yes. is taking place in, in, in legal circles anyway. Yes. Uh, so that's probably the one area that you could, you know, you know, go in and, and, and without the, the law degree and have that kind of effectiveness, because ultimately it's going to often come back to uh, something in the in that industry, in that kind of way of resolving disputes. That's kind of how it's going to end up anyway. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, and that poses a really good question, Sandra, for Rebecca, which is, has that perspective and experience of having to deal with law and lawyers in the insurance where law tries to dominate and control in many, many ways and the insurance industry resists in many, many ways? How has that different perspective worked for you in dealing with law and lawyers for these several decades? Well, what's interesting about that, <clears throat> and you can hear, I, I left my voice in Chicago. Um, I was in a conference and somehow Chicago decided to, to keep my voice. But um, interestingly, of course, as a claims professional, lawyers were, uh, I was the client for lawyers. And so for almost 30 years, my experience um, with lawyers and the law was lawyers telling me the law and me telling lawyers what to do with the law as it applies to insurance. <laughs> In a nice way. <laughs> I know, exactly. I wonder what, what that, words did you use for that? that could have, yeah, this is what you can do with your law. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think we just increased our viewership exponentially. <laughs> exactly. We'll just make the title uh, yeah, of the next one, Telling Lawyers What to Do with the, the Law. The way I framed that was a little creative, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes. But yeah, unintentionally, but it, but it, was, it was effective. Um, but yeah, I was, I was the client. And so um, from that angle, I was, you know, a strategist, became a defensive case strategist, really. Um, and the subject matters that I was able to handle in my career were uh, across the board liability and commercial disputes. So um, from auto and trucking to more complex cases, like, although of course trucking cases can be very, very complex. Construction, product liability, medical malpractice, nursing home and assisted living litigation. Um, also, um, I think I said products, but municipal, I handled um, some I touched on Title IX because I handled public entity claims, school boards and municipalities. So it prepared me to, uh, when I launched into consulting, when I left corporate America, um, I started my own mediation, arbitration and consulting practice and built it to a national practice because of all of my relationships across the country and that subject matter expertise. And so I became a, a consultant for um, mm -hmm. police excessive force cases and some of the other cases you see, premises liability, commercial premises, the Las Vegas shooting case, for instance, I was a consultant on that case. Okay. Um, and so that was experience that I was able to build and use uh, and then roll it into yet another career, mediation and arbitration, which is also um, lawyer dominated. Although the irony, of course, is that mediation uh, did not begin with lawyers. It was, you know, the town elders who were, you know, were called in to, to help resolve disputes with you know, bartering of the townspeople between you know, cows and chickens and whatever they had to negotiate with. That's true. Um, so it really has been you know, the, story, the story of my life um, in a profession that's male dominated, law dominated, um, or uh, as Chuck put it, uh, the efforts in insurance has, you know, has been um, to, to insert law uh, in some spaces where it did or didn't belong. Um, but it, you know, it has been a very rich career and um, I've learned the interdependency uh, and the intersectionality of insurance and law. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it sounds like you may have also learned a mastering of the art of diplomacy because we all know that eh, stale male and pale lawyers tend to come across 
pretty dominantly, pretty aggressively, pretty assertively. How do you deal with that effectively? Well, with emotional intelligence, um, and this is something, because I know this is a, thank you, Chuck, for hosting us again in a, um, uh, inspiring woman type uh, episode. Um, I know who I am. And I, I got that from, uh, that. that is my underpinning from my family. Um, and so I was raised to know who I am. And even in this space as a mediator and arbitrator um, and a non-lawyer, I have nothing to prove. And I've always yeah. known that. And yeah. so that's very powerful when you know that you know who you are and what you bring to the table, and that if you just do your work and let that speak for you, and have and feel like you have nothing to prove, you can be very effective, and it's very powerful and inspiring to other women. And I'm wondering if yes. one of the reasons that's so powerful is you're playing the cards that they not only don't have, but they don't know how to deal with. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. let other people build the narrative. The narrative is, is, is mine. And whatever narrative is around me, that's on them. Um, I carry myself, in a, because I'm a non-lawyer, um, I, I do carry myself a certain way of, you know, in certain environments because I don't want my name attached to certain environments. Um, and so I'm, I am very careful about that because I, I recognize <laughs> the jeopardy but just but and it's just human nature. I'm not really even pointing just at lawyers. Um, it's just human nature. So I, I've learned to be comfortable in my own skin. Um, if, obviously, I stay in my lane. If yeah, I don't I know something, say, that's yeah. probably a key piece of it. Certainly, and in, in, in the in dealing at at that level of the profession that you are, and that yeah. and staying in your lane is not a thing that suggests that you are you know a shrinking violet or that you stay away. But it's like it's, it's like you talk about that, you know, that confidence and that knowing of who you are and being able to, in that lane, garner that, you know, respect from those around you that have to, that are having to, you know, interact with you. And that's an important piece of the notion of staying in one's lane because that's where you are, that's, that's your value, that's what you bring to the table and kind of everybody around you knows that, you know? And uh, I think that's that's one of the things that one of the things I've kind of always admired about Louise was her ability to move in some circles, you know, very early on. Um, Rebecca, I don't mean to be ageist or anything, but I think we may be a little bit um, more seasoned, seasoned. <laughs> more seasoned. seasoned. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I. I've always kind of admired that aspect of Louise sort of from this distance of seeing her kind of move into some circles and places in this community, you know, with that kind of same kind of thing that you're talking about, Rebecca, with that, you know, with that sense of the knowing who you are, but also knowing um, in a way that allows, and, and this is an important thing for, I think, particularly for women in all these fields, I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg has probably given us the best example of that, of that thing of being able to move in those spaces, but also bring the people with you that you need. Yes, um, yes. You, you, it, it's important to develop that ability to, you know, have people go, come along with you. I think that was, yeah, yeah. Yes. But Louise has always been able to do that in a, in a way that... Uh, those of us in Hawaii, you know, particularly women lawyers and, and younger women lawyers, I won't say younger, but those that have recently been licensed, <laughs> recently licensed, I think is one of those, you know, so yeah, yeah, you know, and, and, I, and I, you know, I've done a couple of things too. And so that makes, uh, you know, we, it, you, but you still, like you say, you're, you're, you're in your lane, you're careful to make certain that people, um, you know, give you that kind of respect and you engender that by your own personal integrity and all of those things are so key important. So, yeah. But, you know, you make a distinction, Sandra. There's a difference between staying in your lane and staying in your place. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. Point. Your, your lane is just oh, an acknowledgement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and I know, I mean, yeah, because you said you've done a couple of things. I'm like, that's putting it mildly, Judge Sims. <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm very, very proud to know both of you, obviously, and, and Chuck um, as well as our brother, but stay, you know, there had been that the woman's place and then, you know, areas that women were considered um, where, where women were considered to, to more appropriately be. Um, but staying in your lane just means you understand your wheelhouse and you don't overplay. You play to your strengths and you, you know, you don't have anything to prove. And my secret sauce is that I'm not a lawyer in my space. Well, yeah. Yeah. In your field. Yeah. That may be. Yeah. It is your secret sauce. So here we have three incredibly highly respected women moving in a variety of circles, which were traditionally very, very white male dominated. And Louise, how have you made that work for you? You know, um, I think it goes, I'm trying to, I was trying to think about that and I'm not sure where it started. Um, and maybe it started with going to a college that was really white male dominated. I went to Yale and it was like the second full class of, of uh -huh. women, four year class uh -huh. of women. Uh -huh. So we were only 25%, which part of you thinks, oh boy, that sounds like a great ratio, but it really isn't in terms of building a sense of it's sisterhood. And, <laughs> yeah, it, it can be intimidating, but you at least learn how to get along with people of the other gender. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, part of it is, you know, go, if you go back, it's kind of, you know, where you come from, where, you know, having a good, strong family base and having that maybe, you know, I, I can't say I've always felt super confident. I'm always thinking, oh my God, you know, how do I, how can I compare to all of these other people? But it's like, you just kind of, part of it is you fake it till you make it. And you just use your emotional intelligence too to kind of get to know and get along with people um, and then kind of figure out, you know, where can you add value? And some many times if I'm in a strange situation, you kind of think about, okay, well, you know, so I've been in a conference where you say, they say, where's, what's your superpower? I haven't figured out what my superpower is, but I think it might depend on different situations. Like if I'm on the mainland at a conference and I don't know anybody, the superpower is coming from Hawaii. Um, yeah, because we are unique culturally, historically, um, just everyday life. So, yeah, I think it's kind of like stay in your lane and your lane might differ depending on your, your circumstance, but you don't stay in your place, right? You, you try to add value. Um, you figure you do have something of value to bring. Um, and then at, at the same time, you just try to relate to people too um, as individuals and, you know, not have every interaction be, be a fight, which can, it's not fun yeah. and it can be wearing. Yeah, yeah. Well, those That's are right. great elements to bring up because each of you conveys so clearly and so strongly a sense that you are where you belong to be. And that's just so evident and so undeniable. That may be a part of the magic that makes it persuasive for people to recognize, yeah, you do belong here. And once you get a chance to perform, you absolutely do. I'll give you a quick example. Two very, very good friends from Vietnam, incredible women leaders. One now heads up the fastest growing, largest bio ag conglomerate in Vietnam. Um, and the move away from all of the old climate damaging models to the new ones is just incredible. And the other one is a consultant and advisor for national and international infrastructure projects. And she always tells me every room she walks into is full of old men. And now in her case, they're older Asian men, but Maybe the experience and the perspective have some similarities because she's yeah. saying that's what she brings in, that she belongs there. She knows what she's doing. She puts it out there. And as soon as they see that, 
it puts them at ease. It doesn't challenge them. It doesn't right. compete with them, but it provides a resource and asset and guidance for them. So as we were talking about before we started, the trick is to use that wonderful set of attitudes and abilities to change the traditional male dominant WTF look into a recognition the WTF stands for Women Think Faster. So. <laughs> you went there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, there and done that. So while, you, while you're talking, Chuck, I'm thinking purpose. Um, each of us has had the great fortune of finding our purpose. And we are able to affect different, different environments, different circles. Um, because we have found our purpose. And I believe that every human being has a purpose, but I will share that my name, the Hebrew spelling of Rebecca, means to tie, to bind, to moderate. So I'm doing exactly what I was oh. named to do. Wow. Which I think is incredibly powerful. Wow. Yeah. We all do have a superpower. Okay. We should do a show on that, Chuck. Yeah. Okay, that, that'll be in the next one. So where would you most like to take yours, those, that set of gifts, Louise? Where would I like to take it? Yeah, Golly. what's ahead in your lane? Well, I, um, you know, I'm thinking of the two initiatives I'm working at at the firm, which is, you know, being on the diversity and inclusion committee, and then, um, you know, helping with the um, ESG initiative, the environmental social, uh -huh. Uh -huh. social governance, governance construct that a, a lot of businesses, public and private are going into. And they both kind of come out of the same, I guess, you know, basis, which is, um, you know, the need to realize that we're in a that companies need to be more than just working for their shareholders. They need to think about the community. They need to be diverse and embrace diversity and you know, the environment and sensitive and sustainability and all of that. So I guess it's, you know, in just trying to make going beyond the daily work that we all have to do to try to have some bigger sense of purpose. It's the kind of thing that, you know, they're saying all oh, that the millennials want from their work, but we all want a sense of purpose mm -hmm. of just, you know, not just doing our everyday work, but also trying to create a better world and a better community for all of us and for the future. And I feel like we're at such an inflection point now, you know, you know with political divisions um, that we need to figure out in our own lane and our own way, how we can contribute to making things better saving our democracy yes. <laughs> you know yes. creating a, a better culture you know making america great again in in the true sense for real. of how we should be making it great <laughs> yeah out. for real yeah 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 andrea so what's in what's ahead in your lane you you you've been asking me you know about the the book that i'm working on and i i am working i have these moments of block but the the perspective that i'm working from is it's called healing justice and depending on how you do the uh uh the pronunciation healing justice or healing justice justice that heals or people that are doing things that are working to heal our justice system in different areas so you have know, got a list of folks that i'll be talking with that are that i, I kind of talked to some of them already um you know that, that are taking um, there, they've had careers in the legal field, and they've taken those skills to a different place to address the issues that we have within the justice system, within our society generally. Um, and they've done some creative and imagine and some things that you would be surprised to hear. Well, maybe not surprised, but yeah, yeah. I won't, I'm not going to give away the names, but I mean, go one, I'll describe and it's she's she's not here, but some are some are here in Hawaii, and some are not one um, that I'm particularly, you know, excited about, you know, working with is a woman who um, was a Los Angeles police detective uh, for 30 years. 
and she retired from that field to establish a, a residence in a program for girls who were trafficked. She worked in Vice in Los Angeles for years. So she knows that field. But she took that passion for seeing what's happening to those, to the girls and mostly girls, and turned it into this um, quite a program. And she's quite a voice now on the national scene for addressing, you know, these issues. Incredible woman, incredible woman. Yeah. So and it is Lauren Walker. You know, you guys know her here doing things in restorative justice and looking at ways in which we can. Uh, resolve, particularly in the criminal area. My field, I was in criminal. Um, I wasn't in criminal, but I. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we know, we understand. You get it, you get it. <laughs> Start playing around. Uh, and so in that area, you know, you're, you see a different aspect of society and you also see what we've done uh, as a, as a society to a lot of the folks that, you know, get into our criminal justice system. It isn't that everyone just wakes up and, you know, becomes a horrible person and 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 they're not either. That's that's not a terrible, that's not a way to describe it either. But so much of what is happening within that is situational. And there's situations that we are quite capable of of resolving if we put our minds to it. So that's part of where I'm going. That's fantastic. And one of the things I think we're hearing is that each of you exemplify this movement of and not just staying in your lane, uh, but essentially uh, expanding it to the entire multi-lane highway of moving from individual single silo problem solving and leadership into very systemic areas. Louise with the world's largest law firm, Rebecca with the world's largest gathering of lawyers as a non-lawyer. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> And Sandra in the judiciary, in the community. In the room full of criminals, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. So, I think it's getting out of our comfort zone, right? But getting comfortable yeah. with being out of our yes. comfort zone and, yeah. Yeah. and adapting to that. So that we can impact the next generation. Oh, absolutely. All of, yeah. the, all of the things that we're talking about will make the world a better place for the next generation. And they are ready they don't bow to tyranny. They want to make impact. They are, you know, they, they are unapologetic. And if we do this right, we will empower them. I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and we that circles back to what Sandra was just talking about, which is your book, there is a Hawaiian process for healing justice called Ho'oponopono. Mm -hmm. Ho'o -oh to gather to bring together and other meetings and Pono, that which is right and righteous, mm -hmm. uh, to make that which is right and righteous. You're all doing that. You're all taking that incredible combination of gifts, abilities, and dedication and funneling into a systemic change responsibility that we can all learn from. What's the secret? in our last minute. What's your, Rebecca, you've told us your secret sauce. Louise, Sandra? I don't know if it's a secret sauce, but I think it's probably what Louise said, cut, kind of goes back to, you know, how I was raised in the era that I grew up in. Um, that certainly has a big part to do with it. You know, the notion that, um, you know, you're here to, to serve. To serve. You're here to contribute. I mean, that's just maybe a part of my uh, DNA, as it were. And then coming up in a time when there weren't a lot of, of you know, opportunities and, and avenues for, you know, for women, for blacks, black women, all of it, you know, in the in the in the field that I was in. And then this sort of uh, expectation that you know, you can do this, you will do this. So <laughs> there you are. <laughs> So I, I think that's a part of it too, is that, and so having that support, not just the push, but the support from, you know, from, from community and family in the time that I grew up. I think that was maybe the, the thing that kind of shaped 
uh, shaped me, I think. Well, you folks are amazing. And as we wrap up today's time and session, <clears throat> I'm left with just this truly overpowering feeling that if we could somehow marshal all of what you three bring to the table into leadership, into an oval office of something that would lead this country forward, we'd be fine. Well, we need to find allies. I guess that's another secret sauce, right? We have yes. an allyship going on right in here. Yes. Thanks to our ally, Chuck and Sandra and Rebecca. Um, but I think that we're building allyship circles around the things we're doing. Yes, we yeah. can all be allies and yeah. we can, yeah, and be the bridge to expand. Yeah, and be that bridge to, you know, bringing folks in or reaching out, whatever the case may be. Um, we can do do both of those things. I, I th thanks Chuck for kind of pulling this together. I haven't thought about a lot of these things, you know, um, in my time. You just sort of go through your day. You don't think about that. You think about, yeah. don't even think about the impact you're having on other people and stuff. And I, and I'm starting to see that. And I was like, oh my goodness, I just, you know, I'm just going to the grocery store or doing whatever. And uh, it is making a difference, you know. I yes, I, absolutely, it, it is. It it absolutely is. So I'm gonna. Thank you for keeping my keeping me inspired here as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I want to say thank you, thank you to Chuck for yep. for living yep. a life on purpose. Absolutely, and thank Absolutely. you all for just being and sharing who you are. That should be more than enough for any of us. Thanks, everybody. Come back and join us. We'll, we'll be back in another again. couple of weeks. <laughs> more of women in leadership, perspectives, insights, and inspirations. Take care.